Hello and welcome to What's Up With That, the series that demystifies all things Chrome. I'm your host, Sharon, and today we're talking about open source. What does it mean to be open source? I've heard of Chrome, but what's Chromium? What are all the ways you can get involved? Answering those questions and more is today's special guest, Ellie. Ellie currently works on the Chrome content team, which is focused on making the web more fun and interesting to use. Previously, she's worked all over Chrome and Chrome OS. She's passionate about accessibility, the open web, and free and open source software. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you, Sharon. All right, first question, I think pretty obvious. What is open source? What does that mean? Yeah, um, so, so open source is a pretty old idea, and it basically just means in the purest sense that the source code for a program is open to be read by others. Okay, and Chrome, the open the source code is available to be read by anyone. What else is it? Open source, I've heard of open source community. It seems like there's a lot to it. So why don't you just tell us more about open source generally? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there, there's quite a bit of nuance here, and there's been kind of differing historical interpretations of some of these terms. So I'll there's two, two big camps that are important to talk about. Uh, one is open source, which kind of means what I said, like the source is available to be viewed. There's also the idea of free software, right? Which is software that actually has license terms that allow for people to modify it to make their own derivative versions of it and that kind of thing. Um, and so like historically, there was a pretty big difference between those things. These days, the two concepts are often talked about pretty interchangeably because a lot of open source projects are free software and all free software projects basically are open source. Um, but the distinction used to be very important and is still pretty important, I guess. Um, Chromium is both open source and free software. Um, so we ship under a license that allows for not only for everyone to read and look at our code, but also for other folks to like make their own versions of Chromium, right? So um, yeah, Chromium, both open source and free software. Okay, very cool. And you mentioned Chromium in there, but I think for most people, when they think of the browser, they call it Chrome. So what is the difference between Chrome and Chromium? Are they the same thing? I think people, myself included, sometimes use those interchangeably, especially when you work on it. So what is the difference there? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so Chromium is an open source and free software web browser that is made by the Chromium Foundation, which is like an actual .org that exists somewhere on the internet. Um, Chrome is a Google branded web browser that is basically made by taking Chromium, which is an open source and free software web browser, adding some kind of like Google magic to it, right? Like integrations with some Google services, um, some kind of like media codecs that maybe aren't themselves free software, that kind of thing. Um, bundling that up into a kind of more polished product, which we call Google Chrome, and then shipping that as a, uh, as a web browser, right? So Chromium is an open source project. Google Chrome is a, um, a Google product that is built on top of Chromium. Okay, so Google Chrome is a Chromium-based browser, which is a term I think people who work in any browser stuff is a term they've almost Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you alluded to the fact that we sometimes use those terms kind of interchangeably. Um, and like, especially at, at Google, we sometimes get a little confused about what we're talking about sometimes, right? Because we're um, the, Chrome, the Google Chrome team are the biggest contributors to Chromium, the open source project. And so we tend to sometimes talk about the two things as though they're the same. But there's a really important difference for folks who are working on other Chromium-derived browsers, right? Um, so if you're working on a, um, a Chromium derivative that a Linux distribution ships, for example, your browser is based on Chromium, and it's really not Chrome. It's, it's Chromium, right? It is the open source browser that Chrome is based on, but it's not the same thing at all. Yeah. If you want to learn a bit more about basing things on Chromium, uh, the content episode is a good one to check out. We talk a bit about that and embedding Chrome and Chromium and what that means. So, Yeah, absolutely. And th there's also in, uh, in the Chromium source tree, there's actually a thing called Content Shell, which is a sort of um, like a minimal demonstration browser, right? It's like the, the rendering engine from Chromium wrapped in the least amount of browser possible to make it work. And we use it for testing, but it's also a really good starting point if you're trying to learn how to build a Chromium derivative browser. Okay, very neat. So I think a next very natural question to come out of this is why is Chrome, or Chromium, Chromium rather, I'm gonna try to be good about using those correctly here, but okay. why is Chromium open source? Yeah, um, so this is a decision that we made right when we were starting the project actually. Um, and it's based on this really fundamental idea that the web benefits when users have better browsers, right? So if we, like the Chromium project, come up with some super clever way of doing something, right? Or we come up with some really ingenious optimization to our JavaScript engine or something like that, 
it's better for the web, better for everyone, and ultimately even better for Google as a business if those improvements are actually adopted by other people and taken by other people and used by them, right? So it, it is better for us if other people make use of anything clever that we do. And um, separately from that, there's this idea that's really prevalent in open source communities of, you know, if people can read the code, they're more likely to find bugs in it. And that's something that Chromium constantly benefits from, right? Is folks who are outside the project, just kind of looking through our code base, reading and understanding it, spotting maybe security flaws that are in there, right? Um, that kind of research is so much easier to do when the source code is just there and you're not kind of trying to reverse engineer something you can't see the source to. So we get a lot of benefit from being open source like that. And, um, you know, those reasons, those are the reasons we had originally and those still all hold totally true today, I think. That makes sense. Yeah, it seems at first a bit odd for a big company like Google to make something like this open source, but there are other massive open source things at Google, Android, I think, being the other canonical mm -hmm. example, which, you know, we don't know too much about, but we won't be getting too into that. But there yeah. are other big open source projects around. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also like, uh, there's Go, like that's an, an open source programming environment, like a language and a compiler and a bunch of tools around it that is open source built by Google. Um, there, there are plenty of other open source and kind of free software projects built by large corporations, often for really the same reasons, right? Like we benefit because the entire web benefits from better technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some of the build stuff we do is open source, check out the previous episode for mm -hmm. that. Uh, and that's, yeah, exactly, not strictly only used by. Yeah, uh, and, and by the way, partly because we're open source, like for example, the Chromium base library, which is like part of our, our C++ software environment, right? Our base library is regularly used in other projects, even things that are totally unrelated to browsers, because it provides like a high quality implementation of a lot of basic things that you need to do. Um, and so that code is being used in so many places we would never have anticipated and has done honestly like more good in the world than it would do if it was just, you know, part of a really excellent browser. Something that someone on my first team told me was if you've changed anything in base that probably is going to get run anytime the internet gets run, like somewhere in that stack, which oh, yeah. if you think about it, it's so crazy. Oh yeah, and absolutely. Um, I um, Early in my career, I added a particular error message to part of the Chrome network stack. Um, mm. And that network stack too is one of those components that gets reused in a lot of places. And yeah. so occasionally I'll be running some completely other program, like I'll be running a video game or something, and I'll see that error message that I added being emitted from this program. And I'm like, oh, like my code is living on in a place I would never have really thought of. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those well, unique open source experiences in my book of seeing your own work being used like that by, by other folks you wouldn't have anticipated. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, so something I think I've heard you say before that I thought sounded very cool was the open source dream. So can you tell us a bit more about what that is? What is that vision? It sounds very nice. Yeah, um, so I, I talked about this a little bit, um, and it's earlier I, I cautioned against conflating open source and free software, but like this, it, it really is more of the free software dream than the open source dream in some sense. Um, that dream is this idea that if we have software that is made available for free under licenses that let people modify it and make derivative works and keep using it, um, that over time, everyone will get access to really high quality and freely available software, right? And we will have a kind of situation where the software that people need is built by their communities, like built by the people who are in those communities instead of being kind of, you know, something that they have to buy from, from a company that makes it, right? It'll be something they can instead produce for themselves. Um, and, and over time, I think that this has really has played out in that way, right? Like if you look at the state of operating systems today, for example, there are these really high quality, freely available open source free software operating systems that are like readily available and anyone can use and they really do meet the needs for a lot of folks. And then in fact, like it, it kind of circles back, right? To where like Linux is a high quality free software open source operating system that Google can then turn around and make really good use of to build something like Chromium OS, right? Which is another free software open source project that uses Linux as one of its major components. Um, and then we get to produce a product that like the Chromium OS engineering team would have had to spend a lot of time if we weren't able to make use of that existing Linux kernel work, right? So mm -hmm. it, it really, you get into this kind of like cycle of giving back and sharing and benefiting from the effects of other people sharing, that's like the free software dream to me. It does. Yeah, that sounds great. And it for sure, like 
I try to use open source options when I can. When I edit these videos, I use something open source feels appropriate for, you know, what we're doing here. So yeah, yeah that sounds like it would be, it, it's a good system that everyone contributes to and everyone benefits from. And that's mm -hmm. yeah, really nice. Absolutely. So going away from that towards the more less open source part. So what kind of things in Chrome, the browser are not open source. You mentioned a couple of things earlier. Can you tell us a bit more about some of those things? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to caveat this by saying that I don't personally work on the stuff I'm about to talk about. And so my knowledge is, is more superficial. Um, there's a couple of things I'm pretty confident about. So one is, uh, for example, there's a few video formats that Chrome can play that Chromium cannot play because Google has like agreements with the companies that make those codecs that allow us to like basically, you know, license and embed their thing and ship it as part of Chrome. Um, but those agreements, we can't really extend them to like everyone who might make a Chromium browser. And so it ends up in a situation where like there's a closed source component that's included in Chrome to, to make that possible. Um, I'm struggling to think of another example right off the top of my head. I believe that there's also a couple things in Chrome that are integrating with Google APIs where we're, there are features that are kind of Chrome specific because they're sort of Google specific. And one of the things that is like generally true between the two products is that um, Chrome will have more Google integrations and more Google magic and more like Google smarts than Chromium will. And so I think some of those are actually like closed source components that come from Google that get embedded into Chrome, but because they're closed source, we wouldn't want to put them into Chromium. Right. It seems like, yeah, I, I can sign into Chrome. I don't, expect that I'd be able to sign in with my gmail.com into, say, Chromium. I'm not yeah. sure if it's actually part of it, but that's a guess. Yeah, so that um, that does work, uh, except that you need to, any Chromium distributor needs to go and talk to, basically, like, talk to the sign-in team to get an API key that allows their browser to sign in. Um, there, there is a process for doing that. It doesn't actually require any closed source code components. Um, but there is still a, a thing where... You have to talk to the accounts team and basically be like, you know, hey, we're a legitimate web browser and we want to allow users to sign in um, because we don't want a situation where like, you know, like bots or malware are doing fake user sign-ins from pretending to be Chromium. That's bad. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think because of where Chrome and Chromium are positioned, I think there will be some interesting comparisons and differences between Chrome, Chromium and other internal Google 3 uh projects. So that's kind of the term for things that are closed source Google, you know, the typical like um, maps, search, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And also comparing Chromium to other open source projects. So yeah. we've talked a bit about the similarities and differences between Chrome and uh, Google internal. Are there any other things you can think of that are either similar or different between Chrome, the project and the people who work on it and how people do things internally at Google? Yeah. Um, so internally at Google, there's this very powerful, very custom built kind of whole technology stack around the projects, right? Like there's a, a continuous integration system. There's an editor. There's a source control system. There's all of this stuff. Um, within Google, all of that is custom and it's all fitted to Google's needs. And it's all a lot of it is just built from scratch, frankly. Um, whereas for Chromium, we're using essentially off the shelf open source stuff to meet a lot of those needs. So for example, for version control, we're just using Git, right? Which is like the, I think the most popular version control system in the world right now, it's definitely open source. Um, and like our build system, for example, which is like GN and Ninja put together, those are both free software open source projects. Admittedly, both of them were, I think, started as part of Chromium because we had those needs, but they themselves are free software components that anyone else can also use to build a Chromium. And the, the reason why that's done that way, like, why doesn't, it's a, actually a really good question of like, why doesn't Chrome, which is a Google project, use all of this amazing infrastructure for engineering that Google has, right? And the answer is, we want the Chromium projects to be possible to work on for people who don't work at Google, right? And so we can't say, you know, oh, hey, whenever you're going to make a change, you have to commit it into Google's internal source control system, right? Like that wouldn't work at all. So we're, we're almost... Because we want to be an open source project and because we want to have contributors from outside of Google, we end up uh, almost pushed into using this like this pretty open free software stack, um, which I, to be honest, from my perspective, has a lot of other benefits, right? Like when we have new folks joining the team, we can actually offer them tools they're already pretty familiar with, right? Like they don't have the, the feeling that new Googlers sometimes get where they're like, 
you know, totally disoriented, like everything they know about programming is, is doesn't apply anymore, right? We can actually be like, you know, hey, here's Git. You know how to use this, right? Here's Garrett, which is a, another piece of open source software that we use. Like, they may not have used Garrett before, but a lot of projects do, and so they might have run into it previously. So um, it has it has pluses and minuses, definitely. Um, so that's, that's a big difference. Um, there's also a bit of um, what I would say is like kind of a cultural difference more than anything else. Um, because most Google projects that are not open source, right? So I'm, I'm not talking about things like Android or like Go or something like that, but like projects that are really just not open source, like Search. Um, they, their ecosystem of like discussion and kind of culture and stuff is very much inside Google, right? Whereas for Chromium, we constantly are getting ideas and suggestions and code changes and stuff from outside of Google. And so we also tend to have perspectives from outside of Google in our discussions more often as we work on Chromium, right? Um, so like part of that is at, at the, the sort of um, the level of like if we're going to make a change, we would have maybe input coming in on that change from Mozilla even, right? Like they're a group we collaborate with a ton on web standards. And so we would have their perspective in the discussion. Um, whereas if we were working entirely within Google, we might not have those external perspectives. So culture-wise, I feel like Chromium has more perspectives in the room sometimes when we're thinking about stuff. That makes sense because browsers exist across other companies too, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of compatibility and standards and stuff. So kind of just Absolutely. by that nature of things, you have to have a lot more of this collaboration. Absolutely. If you make a change, it'll affect all of the embedders maybe, and then you have to think about this. And yeah, there's a lot more discussion. Yeah, Absolutely. Like you know, if you're search, you're like, okay, we're going to, I don't know, do our thing. Yeah, you you have more, uh, I don't know if autonomy is the right word, um, but uh, yeah, I, I want to caveat this by saying I'm not on search, and so maybe it's totally yeah. different, but that's how it looks to me as a person who works on Chrome. Yeah, yeah, and I think in terms of actual um, development and, like, making code changes and stuff, I think probably the biggest difference is that because anyone can download the source repository and make changes mm -hmm. and all that, the actual programming and changes you do, like you do those on a computer, right? Maybe that's a machine you SSH into or, you know, like a cloud top or whatever, but you have to actually download all of the code. Whereas with all of that's the true. Google free stuff, everything happens in a cloud somewhere. So everything is yeah. all connected and you just do things through the browser pretty yeah. much. That's very with true. Um, actually, there's another, another important facet that just occurred to me, which is because uh, Chromium is open source, and in particular, uh, some open source projects will use this model where they, they send out a release every so often. So they'll be like, we're shipping a new major release of our program, and here's the source that corresponds to that. So there are companies that do that. But we actually um, do what's called developing in the open. So our main Git repository that stores our source is public, which means that as soon as you put in a commit, or even if you just put it up for code review, that's public. Like everyone on the internet can kind of see what we're doing live. Um, which is really pretty interesting, like in terms of its effects on you, right? So like, for example, if you're in, you're working inside Google three and you're like, I have this really cool wild idea. I'm gonna go and make an experimental branch and just kind of make a prototype of it and see what happens, right? Um, you can just go do that, it's not a problem. But if you're working in Chromium and you go and make your wild prototype experimental branch, you have pr a pretty good chance that someone's gonna notice that. And then maybe you get like a news story that's like, hey, Chromium might be adding this amazing feature. And you're like, oh no, that was my wild experimental idea. I didn't intend for this to happen, but now people have really like picked up on it. And like people outside of the company that you've never met are starting to get excited about something that you never really intended to build and just wanted to try. So it's, it's a different way of working, right? You, you're sort of, always in the public eye a little bit and you want to be a little bit more considerate about how something might look to people way outside of your team and outside of your context whereas teams that are inside google 3 i don't think have to think about that as much yeah i mean for me like i've only really worked in chromium you know full-time mm -hmm. and all that and i've kind of just gotten used to the fact that all of my code changes are fully public and anyone can look yeah. at them whereas i think people who work in you know anything that's not like that mm -hmm. uh you know people in the company you work i can see it but not just like anyone out there so i think i don't know yeah. i've gotten used to it but i think it's not a typical thing to oh yeah <laughs> absolutely and in fact this is something that folks who are transferring into chrome from other parts of google sometimes have a little difficulty with is like if you're used to writing a commit message where maybe the only description in the commit message is like you know go slash doc about my project, right? For Chromium, that doesn't fly because only Googlers can actually follow those links. And so the commit message to a non-Googler doesn't say anything. And so you actually have to start thinking, 
how am I going to explain this whole thing I'm doing to a non to a person who doesn't have any of this Google specific context about what it is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you go through this little mental, you know, you cross this little mental bridge where you actually are forced to reframe your own work away from what are Google's business goals and towards like, how does this fit Chromium, the open source project that other people also use? It's, it's interesting and occasionally a little frustrating, but interesting and usually really beneficial. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, from people I've talked to, it just seems like another briefly difference between internal Google stuff and Chromium is mm-hmm. that internal Google just has a ton of tools you can use, right? Yes, Which absolutely. Both means a lot of things that are maybe a bit challenging in Chromium are probably easier, but also maybe finding the right tool is hard. But oh yeah, you yeah. know that I'm that curious. is very much the case. I have only limited experience working inside Google three, but I definitely have experienced the the profusion of tools. Um, and also the fact that the tools are just honestly amazing, right? And like, it, it makes total sense. Like Google has many, many engineers whose whole job is to build great tools. And Chromium is just not that big of a project. So we just don't have that many folks who are working on it. The folks who do build infrastructure work for Chromium do amazing work, but there's not hundreds of them, right? And so like, it's not not on the same level. Yeah. And what you said earlier uh, makes me have, gives me like, has... Uh, makes me wonder, and this ties us into the next thing, of other open source projects, they just do a release, and they don't maybe do development in the open. And having not actually worked on other open source projects, really, um, I kind of assume that this development in the open was a norm. So how common do you think, or do you know, that practice is? Um, gosh, I, I would really be guessing, to be honest with you. But I, I would say the development in the open is by far the norm these days. Um, and when you see projects that, that follow the, the big release model instead, the, the way that looks is, you know, they'll be like, hey, version 15 is out and here's the source for version 15. You can look at it. But the development as it happens, happens internally. Um, I would tend to associate that with being like maybe big company projects that have a lot of um, confidentiality concerns, right? So if, for example, um, if you're building, you know, the software that goes with some cool new hardware for your company, you don't want to start checking that software into Git like publicly because then people are going to read it and be like, "Ooh, this has you know support for a billion megapixel camera. That must be coming in the new the new thing, right?" Um, and so I think that the the big release model might be these days more prevalent when people are doing like hardware integrations where there's other components that are shipping at a fixed time, and you don't want your source to be open until that point. Um, but but honestly, the the developing in the open model is is. I think much more common these days. Uh, back in historically, you know, like back in the the seventies and eighties, when you would buy an operating system and it would come with source, like that was just a thing that you got as part of the package. Then it was much more of the you know the source is released with the OS model. Um, whereas these days, because distributed development is so easy with um, modern version control systems, it's just so common to to just develop in the open like we do. Oh, cool! I didn't know that. Um... So compared to other open source projects, what are some similarities and differences that Chromium has to others that you may be familiar with? Ooh, um, all the ones I'm familiar with are, are quite a bit smaller than Chromium, and so it's going to be hard to talk about it because, frankly... That's probably a um, common difference, though, right? Like, probably yeah. very few are as big as... Chromium. Oh, yeah. Um, so the, um, in particular, one of the hardest problems in open source like in running an open source project is managing how humans relate to other humans, right? Like the the code problems are often relatively easy. The problems of like, how do we make decisions about the direction of a project that maybe has a hundred contributors who speak 10 different languages across a dozen time zones, that's a hard problem, right? Um, and so um, I often talk about like the idea between, you know, open source, open development, and then like open governance, right? And so open source is just like, you can see the source. Open development is you can see the development process. So the Git repo is open, the bug tracker is open, the mailing lists where we do a lot of our discussion are open. So we do open development, but then you have this next step of like open governance where the big decisions about where the project is going are made in the open. And for Chromium, some of those are made in the open, especially when it's like really about the web platform or that kind of thing. Um, but some of them are not, right? Like, for example, if we're deciding that we're going to do some cool new UI design, right? Um, that design and the initial development of it might not necessarily be, or sorry, the development would be done in the open, but the designing of it might not, right? Like, that might be a discussion between a few 
UX designers who all work at Google in a Google internal place. Um, and so Chromium kind of has a bit of open governance, but not all the way. Um, a lot of smaller projects have super open governance, right? So they'll literally be like, you know, hey, should we rewrite this entire thing in Rust? And they'll make that decision by arguing about it on a mailing list where everyone can see, and that's totally, totally fine, right? Um, because Chromium is so big, we can't make those kinds of decisions by having every Chromium engineer have their opinion and just, like, post. Like, it would be complete chaos, right? Um, and uh, because we're, like, big and kind of prominent, a lot of the work that we do is very much in the public eye. And so even discussions that are maybe, you know, like, relatively speculative, like that example I gave before where you have, like, an idea and you're like, wouldn't it be neat if we did this? It's easy for that to turn into people inferring what, Google's intentions are with like title case, right? Like big, you know, important thing. Um, and, and turning that into a lot when you would not have intended it to be that way. And, and so um, we do end up keeping our governance relatively on the closed side compared to other open source projects I've worked on. Um, other than that, um, in terms of like engineering practices on like what we do to get the code written, um, we uphold a super high standard of quality um, and in particular, um, like, which is not to say that most open source projects don't, because like they totally do. Um, but Chromium, in my opinion, is really, really thoughtful about not just, you know, like, hey, how should code review work? But really evolving stuff, like how should we bring new developers into this project? What should that feel like? Those are discussions that we have. And I often feel like those are discussions that other open source projects don't talk about as much. Um, um, what else is different for us? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think that those are some of the big ones. Um, it's it's the differences in scale are such that it's almost kind of hard to talk about there, right? Like they, the difference between an open source project that maybe has five contributors and one that has 500 is very very large. Mm -hmm. With the open governance thing you mentioned, mm -hmm. something that that made me think of is maybe blink intense, where you submit a thing to a list and then that gets discussed. So that's yeah. sort of the Chromium um, project, I think, right? That yep. falls under that category. Yep, yep. And so that's where if you want to make a change to Blink, the rendering engine, you do this process of posting it to a list and then people weigh in. Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, Blink really does do open governance in a way that I, that I honestly like very much admire. Like Blink and the W3C and like a lot of these groups that are setting standards for the internet do do open governance. Um, because frankly, like it's it's the only way for them to work, right? Like, it, um, it would not be good or healthy for the web if it was just like we're going to do whatever you know whatever we Google have decided to do, and like you know good luck everyone else. Like that would be very bad, right? Um, so uh, yeah, Blink definitely does do open governance, but when it gets to things that are more part of like the browser's behavior and features, we tend to have the governance a little more closed, mm -hmm. right? And I think and, an, yeah, an example of Blink being more open governance is the fact that Blink on uh, is open to anyone yeah. to participate to. And that's yeah. the channel that we're posting this on right now. It just happened to make sense that I figured most of the audience who is mm -hmm. watching Blink on Talks already are interested in these too. So that's why yeah, these absolutely. Are the Blink on channel and for people who may not absolutely. have, may um, have found these videos that don't know about Blink on, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And just in that vein of like open governance for, for Blink especially, um, there's also this idea of like being a, a standard and then having things be compatible with it, right? So um, the web platform is a collection of standards and other browsers have to implement those standards too. And so for example, if we, you know, if we make up a standard that is very difficult or impossible for like Firefox to implement, that's not good, right? Like that's fragmenting the web platform. That's a bad thing. Um, whereas like the Chromium UI, like how the Omnibox works in Chromium, for example, isn't a standard. Like it doesn't matter whether... You know, it doesn't matter whether Firefox or Edge or Opera or whoever have the same Omnibox behavior as us, right? And so there's much less of a need to kind of like all agree. And instead, it's almost a little bit better to have some variety there, right? So that users can get a little bit more of a choice and that like collectively more things get tried in that vein. So there's there's places where agreement and standardization are really important. And then there's places where it's it's actually okay for each individual browser to go off on its own a bit and be like, hey we thought of this cool new way to do bookmarks. And so we have built this and like, it doesn't matter whether the other browsers agree about it because bookmarks are not a thing that interoperates between browsers. Yeah, that makes sense. So now let's talk about some of the actual details of what it's like to work on 
uh, Chromium and make changes, write code, and do mm -hmm. ideas. So I think you mentioned a few things like bug tracking. That's all mm -hmm. public in the open. Yep. Apart from, of course, like security sensitive things, oh, and yeah, other yeah, things yeah. are um, hidden. Uh, what else is there? Uh, code review. That was Garrett. Mm -hmm. You mentioned yep. that. So yep. you can see all the comments that everyone leaves on everyone's changes. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. yeah. Um, and for better or for worse, by the way, uh, uh, it's good to bear in mind that if you're like, you know, you're going to type like a slightly jerk message to someone on a code review, that's going to be preserved for all time and everyone's going to be able to see it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, be nice to people. Um, <laughs> uh, version control, that's Git. Probably people will know about that. Yep. Um, something that is uh, might be worth mentioning is that a lot of people who contribute to Chromium and if you look at things like Garrett and Chromium Code Search, that's also um, mm -hmm. public, of course, looks a lot like Google internal code search, but obviously mm -hmm. it's um, yeah. open source. So a lot of people have at chromium.org emails. Yes. So why are there separate emails? Because you can use at mm -hmm. google.com or a Gmail or any email. So why yeah. do you have this at chromium.org email thing? Yeah, um, so there, there's a few different reasons for that. Um, so chromium.org emails are available to kind of members of the project, which is like a little bit nebulously defined, but it's definitely not, you know, just Googlers, right? Um, and so there, there's a couple of reasons why people like having those. Uh, so for some folks, it's, it's sort of a signal that you are acting as a member of the open source project rather than acting with your like Google hat on, if you like, right? Um, and so for example, I help run the community moderation team for Chromium. And so when I'm doing work for that team, I'm very careful to use my chromium.org account because I want it to be clear that I'm enforcing the Chromium community guidelines, right? Which are something that was agreed upon by a whole bunch of Chromium members, not just Googlers. And so I'm not enforcing like Google's code of conduct. I'm enforcing Chromium's code of conduct with my in my role as a Chromium project person, right? So sometimes you 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 know deliberately put on your Chromium hat so that you can make it clear that you are acting on behalf of the project. Um, some folks, and I'm also one of these folks, by the way, just happen to really like be big fans and supporters of free software and of open source. And so, you know, if I have the choice between between sort of wearing my corporate identity and wearing my like open source project member identity, I might just wear my open source project member identity and decide to actually contribute that way, right? Um, and so a lot of the, the folks who've been on Chromium or have been on Chrome, I should say, for a while, um, that's part of their reasoning. Like they, they joined because they were excited to work on something that was open. And so they have this open source identity, this Chromium identity that they use for that. Um, there's a third factor, and this touches on one of the sometimes less pleasant parts of working in open source, right? Which is our commit log and our bug tracker and all of that stuff are public. And what that means is that everyone on the internet can go see them. And that is often great, but it's occasionally not great, right? So like, for example, if you go and make an unpopular UI change, people on the internet know that that was you, right? And that might not be something that you're like necessarily super ready to deal with, right? Uh, so like, for example, um, way, 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 way early in my career, I made a change to Chromium OS because I was working, I was on the Chrome OS team as a brand new Googler. So this is like, I've been at Google maybe five or six months. I made a change to Chrome OS. Um, somebody happen to notice it and take issue with it. Like, I, I don't even remember what the change was or the issue, but they happened to notice it and take issue with it. They showed up in our IRC channel because we used IRC at the time, uh, which was also public because the whole project was very open like that. And really just started like yelling at me personally about it, right? And I'm like, you know, this is like not, not a cool experience, right? This is something that if this was a Google coworker of mine, I would be talking to HR about this but it's actually just a random person on the internet, right? And so there are some folks who kind of use their, their Chromium username as a little bit of a layer of insulation almost, right? Where it's like, I wanna work on this project, but I don't, you know, like maybe my Google username has my full name in it. Like I don't necessarily want every change I make to be to be done like that, right? Um, and so like, if you don't do that, you can end up in a situation where you make a change and then like it's really attributed to you as though you, it was, you know, your personal idea and like you did this bad thing, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's that's not a risk that everyone wants to take as part of doing their work. And so sometimes people have a Chromium.org account really because they want an identity that's separate from their Google account, right? Um, like that has a different name on it, that has different stuff like that. 
Um, and so one of the things that I'm always con uh, cautious to remind folks of on my team is um, if you're working with someone who has a Chromium.org account, always use that Chromium.org account when you're speaking in public. Always, 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 right? Because like, you, you don't want to like break that, that veil if someone is kind of relying on it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think in general, like whenever you are um, signing up for interacting in these like public spaces, generally, I think it's encouraged to use your Chromium.org account. So for example, yeah. Slack, which is the mm -hmm. modern current uh, IRC option. It, for it hurts my soul to hear you say that. Well, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a diehard IRC user. I've been using IRC for like 30 years. And I, I was one of the few people who was, I think, very sad when we decided to move off IRC. Um, but you're right that it is the, the modern IRC option. I think a lot of people are very diehard about IRC. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but modern in that that's what's currently being used. Rather Absolutely. Than previous. Um, yeah, so Slack is where yeah. anyone can join and discuss mm -hmm. Chromium stuff. And generally that kind of thing, you're encouraged to use your Chromium yeah, absolutely. And to be fair to Slack also, like the, the Slack has probably 30 times as many people in it as the IRC channel ever did. So I think that it's it's pretty clear that Slack is more popular than, than IRC was. Um, but yeah, no, we, we use our Chromium identities a lot. Um, really, really on purpose. And I, to be honest, I would like it if we use them even more. Like sometimes you will see folks who actually have both identities signed up. So they'll have their google.com and their Chromium. And that's always confusing for everyone. So if it was up to me, I would say everyone has a Chromium identity and they just all use it when they're contributing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely one of these like unique to Chromium slight uh, pain points of someone Absolutely. has. They use their maybe often they're the same for most people, but sometimes yep. they're different. Sometimes they're very subtly different and it's, you end Absolutely. up saying, you know, your review. I, I also, I have met a couple of folks who uh, the Google username they really wanted wasn't available, but it was available for chromium.org. And so they picked a shorter, cooler username for chromium.org, which is like totally, totally fine to do. Uh, but then every time you have to remember, you know, oh, you know, I know them by this, this longer Google username, but actually they use the shorter username for chromium. Yeah, you have to remember their real life name. You have to remember their work email. And then now you have to remember another work email. Oh, so. We have we have software that can help with that a bit. So Yeah, um, for sure. So as part of um, that, and that's in a way, in a thing that I, to me, feels very related is there's a thing called being a committer in mm. Chromium. So mm. what does it mean to be a committer and what does it entail? Yeah, um, so committers are basically people who are trusted to commit CLs, for want of a better way of putting it. So the, the way the project is structured, anyone can upload a CL. And like anyone anywhere on the internet can upload a CL. Um, it has to be reviewed by the owners of the, the directories that it touches or whatever. Um, but there are some files that are actually like uh, owners equals star, right? So for example, the... Um, um, the build file in Chrome browser, because everybody needs to edit it all the time. It just has owners equals star. And it's like, there's a comment that's like, hey, if you're, you know, if you're making a huge change, ask one of these people. But like, otherwise, you're just kind of freely allowed to edit it. And so if the committer system didn't exist, anyone on the internet would be allowed to edit a bunch of parts of the project without any review, which is pretty bad. And so there's this extra little kind of speed bump where it's like, you have to send in a few CLs to, to show that you're really like a legit person who's contributing to the project. Um, and once you've done that, you get this kind of committer status, which actually allows you to push the button that makes Garrett commit your change into the tree. Um, and we, that's, that's what it does like mechanically, right? We culturally tend to have it mean something a little different than that, but it's culturally, it's like a sign of trust of the other project members in you, right? So getting that committer status really means, you know, we collectively trust you to, to not totally screw things up, right? Like that's what it is. Um, and so you have to be a committer to actually be in an owner's file, for example, right? Like you can't be listed as an owner until you're a committer, because if you're not a committer yet, we're not really, if we're not trusting you to commit code, we're not really going to trust you to review other people's code, right? Um, but, um, and yeah, when you're new joining the project, it's actually a, a pretty big milestone to become a committer. Like it's, you become a committer after you've been working for anywhere from like three to six months, I would say. And it's definitely this moment of being like, yeah, I've really arrived, right? Like I'm no longer new on the project. I'm now a full committer. 
Can you briefly tell us what the steps mechanically to becoming a committer are? Yeah. Um, so you need to have landed enough CLs to convince people you know what you're doing. And that, there's no hard and fast limit. Um, but it's like, it should be convincing, right? And so I often hear like, you know, oh, maybe 15 to 20 of like non-trivial CLs is a pretty good number. Um, having done that, you need someone to propose you or nominate you for committership. So there's actually, there's a mailing list for having these discussions. Um, and so whoever's going to nominate you who has to already be a committer, they'll send mail to that list, uh, basically being like, I would like to nominate this person for committer. Um, there's a comment period during which people can, can kind of reply. Um, and then if there's nobody who is like raising a kind of like a big objection to you being a committer, um, after, I don't know what the actual time period is, um, but after some amount of time, uh, kind of the, the motion carries with no objections. Um, and then your Chromium account becomes a committer. I think Google accounts can also be committers as well, uh, but I've only ever done this process for Chromium accounts. Okay. Um, and so those, those threads, um, what what's going on in those threads is mostly people endorsing the request, right? So um, let's say that I have someone who's new on my team who I want to propose as a committer. I'll start the thread nominating them as a committer, and then I'll go and talk to like maybe two or three of the people who've reviewed a lot of their changes. And I'll be like, hey, would you endorse this person for a committer? If so, please post in this thread. And so in the thread, there'll actually be a couple of like replies that are kind of like plus one, you know, or like, you know, yes, this seems like a good fit. Um, very rarely there might be a reply which is like you know hey i saw some uh i saw some stuff on the cl that shows that maybe this person isn't quite ready right like we had a whole bunch of back and forth comments and eventually it really didn't seem like they they understood what i was asking for and i feel like they're they're not really ready yet like sometimes that will happen um but usually the threads like by the time someone's nominating you you're already kind of in good shape um so that's that's the mechanical process and then uh, there is, it might actually just be Eric individually who kind of goes through and flips the bits on people being committers based on the threads. I'm not sure. Uh, but there's there's some process by which those threads turn into people being committers. Okay, cool. Is there an analog of this either internally at Google or in other open source projects? Because internally at Google, there's the concept of readability, which means mm -hmm. you are uh, vouched for that you know mm -hmm. how to code in this one language, which has some similarities. Um, yeah. That's maybe a similar thing. Are there any similar notions in other projects you've seen? Yeah, um, so many projects have this notion of, of being a member, right? Um, and th that often combines our notions of committer and sometimes code owner. Um, and so they might, or, or for some open source projects, you'll actually hear like maintainer as like the, the thing, right? And so they'll be like, you know, uh, only people who are project members can upload changes in the first place, and only people who are maintainers can merge those changes. So that that kind of um, little speed bump on entry is pretty common, um, because it's it's a fact of life that if you are on the public internet and you have no barriers to entry, you're going to have spam in your community, like no matter what you do. Um, and so that kind of split is super, super common. Um, for some projects that don't do open development, um, you know, the entire thing might happen inside a company or inside an organization anyway. And then there is no notion of committer status because you're just hired onto that team and then you can commit, right? Um, but for, for projects that do open development and free software projects, there is often a sense of like, these are the people who are roughly trusted to land code. Um, and for a lot of projects, especially bigger ones, there's actually a, a kind of two-tiered model where maybe you have people who are domain experts on a specific thing. Like they maintain some subsystem and they're trusted to make whatever changes they need or approve other people's changes in that area. But then at the wider scale, there's, you know, what's often called like a steering committee or like a core group or something. And those groups have authority over the whole project and the direction of everything that's going on. Um, and so you'll often see that kind of model in larger projects. Um, at smaller scales, it's often literally, you know, a list of one to five people who all have commit access to the same Git repo and there's no, no structure on top of that. But for bigger projects, governance becomes a real concern. And so people start thinking about that. All right, now let's switch topics to talking about the more day-to-day -day logistics of working on Chromium. So if you're not a Googler, don't work at Google, to what extent can you effectively contribute to Chromium, the project? 
Yeah, um, so that that kind of depends where you're coming from, both, you know, whether you're part of another large organization, like maybe you work at Microsoft, you work at Opera, Vivaldi, one of those companies, um, or if you're really like an, an IC, like kind of loan contributor. Um, if you're in a large organization, um, probably your org will have its own structure around how you should contribute anyway. And so like, you might just want to talk about that. So I'll really focus on the I, the individual contributor uh, angle. Um, and so uh, for engineers specifically, like if you're a programmer who wants to contribute to the code base, um, that's awesome. Um, the the best approach, I think, is really to to find an area that you're passionate about because it's like so much more fun and enjoyable to contribute when you're doing something you care about. So find an area you care about, um, get in touch with the team that works on that area, either through their mailing lists or like find their component in Monorail or find them in the owner's files or whatever, get in touch with those folks. Um, ask them what are good places for you to contribute as a new person. Um, that's often a really great way to get started. And you'll have a person you can kind of go to for advice to be like, hey, you know, how do I go about doing this thing? Like my experience has been that Chromium contributors are pretty much all super helpful. And so they're very willing to just kind of give you guidance or, or do whatever. And you'll then know who to send your code reviews to. Cool. Yeah. And if you're not an engineer, what are some ways you can also contribute? Yeah, um, so there, there's a whole bunch of these. And by the way, these all apply to basically every open source project, so not just Chromium specifically. Um, so open source projects, uh, if you are a good writer, if you enjoy doing technical writing or you enjoy doing UX writing or you want to do that kind of thing, almost every open source project out there is looking for people to contribute documentation. And Chromium is no exception at all to that, right? So high quality documentation, we love that stuff. Or even if you're just kind of honing that craft and you want to practice, like Chromium is not a bad spot to do that. Um, if you're a UX designer or a visual designer, um, a lot of open source projects will actually appreciate your contributions, right? Of you bringing in like, you know, hey, I thought of a way that this uh, this user experience could feel, right? Or like how this screen could look or something like that. They'll often appreciate that kind of input or design work. Um, if you are uh, someone who speaks multiple languages, translations are another great way to contribute to open source projects. Um, a lot of open source projects don't have access to the same kind of like, like, you know, Chromium has access to like a translation team within Google who do a lot of our translations. Um, a lot of open source projects don't have that. And so contributing translations of documentation, of like user facing interface, stuff like that can be super valuable. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which can be done by really anyone, like you don't even need special skills for this one, is try early releases of stuff, right? So try development branches. Like if you're, if you're a Chrome user, try running beta or dev or canary. And then when something doesn't feel right or when it's like, you know, when it doesn't work for you or it crashes or whatever, file bugs and try to get practiced at filing good bugs, like with details and info and like steps to reproduce the bug and stuff like that. Um, that's such a huge help as a developer of any open source project, like to get that early user feedback and be able to correct problems before they make it to, uh, to the stable channel. Um, and on Chromium, I've run into a few folks who just, their main contribution to the project is really just that they file great bugs all the time. Like there's a few folks who all they really do is they run Canary on Mac and they notice when something doesn't feel quite right. And so they file stuff that's like, maybe the engineering team wouldn't necessarily have noticed it, but when someone calls it out, we're like, oh, that actually does feel kind of janky. And now we can go fix that. And getting that feedback early is so, so valuable. So there's a lot of different ways. Those are some, but there's, there's plenty more too. Yeah, and a few things on that. If you want to really try out random things, you can, you can go to Chrome colon slash slash flags, play around there, see what happens. Uh, in terms of going back a bit for being an engineer, there's other web adjacent stuff that you can do that we won't get into too much now, but that can be things like adding web platform tests, web standard stuff. Um, and for people who are into security, we have a VRP, vulnerability rewards panel, but if you know about that, like probably you're into the whole security space, you know, this is not how you're going to, maybe this is how you heard about it and you want to get into it, but. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, I will say if you're a security researcher and you aren't familiar with the Chromium VRP, you should go take a look. Um, Cause it's, Chromium is a really interesting project to audit for security and the VRP can make it very worth your while to do so if you find good bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And going back a bit earlier to being an engineer, like a, you know, I see who is not at Google or any of these other big companies, there are other barriers to entry to being a contributor, right? So oh, yeah. I definitely encountered this after my internship. I worked on Chrome. I was like, hey, I know what's going on now at the end of it. A couple of things I didn't finish. I'll go home and I will keep working on this, right? Good intentions. <laughs> and I got home, got my laptop, which was a pretty good laptop, but still a laptop. 
I downloaded Chrome, that took a very long time. I built it for the first time, which always takes a bit longer, but that took so long. And even the incremental builds just took so long that I was like, okay, this is, this is not happening. I'm in school right now. I've got other things to worry about. So how feasible is it for a typical person, let's say, to actually you know, make changes in Chrome? Then? Yeah, um, that, that is unfortunately probably the biggest barrier to entry for individuals who want to make technical contributions. Like, it obviously doesn't affect you if you're contributing documentation, translations, whatever, but if you're trying to, to modify the code, um, yeah, the initial build is going to be very slow, and then the incremental builds are going to be very slow. And, like, a lot of the ancillary tasks are slow, too, like running the test suite or, like, running stuff in a debugger. Um, the, the project is just very big, um, and... Uh, that's something that that I think a lot of folks on the Chromium team wish we could kind of reduce. Um, but it's Chromium is big because the web is big and because what people want it to do is big. And so like it's not just big for no reason, but it does make it harder to get started as a contributor. Um, I have had this experience too. Like I have a modern laptop sitting on the desk over there, and it's um, it takes seven to eight hours to do a clean Chromium build on that. Whereas like on my work workstation, which has access to Goma, Google's compile farm, uh, it takes like a few minutes. And like the large organizations that contribute also all have compile farms for the same reason. Like it's just so slow to work when you're only doing local building and don't have access to a ton of compilation power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder if we could, I don't know, do a thing for people who are individuals who contribute more. Probably that would be really hard to do. Probably people have thought about it. Um, but yeah. It would be nice if we could. Uh, I, I don't know what the challenges would be offhand, but it would be very cool if we could somehow make that available. All right, that all sounds very cool. I know I learned a lot. Hopefully some of you learned a lot too. I think if you are working within Google, it's really easy to not really interact with any of this more open source stuff, depending on which part you work on. Maybe you work on a part that's you know very Google Chrome specific. I know before I was working on Fuchsia, so that was before launch. So that was not really you know something we were open to the public about anyway. And a lot of even the typical Chrome tools I was unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. So I think depending on you know which part you work on, this stuff, it's all there, but you might not have had a chance to interact with. So thank you, yeah. Ellie, for telling us about it and giving us some context about free and open source software in general. Yeah, of course. Is there anything you would like to give a shout out? Normally we shout out a specific Slack channel. I think in this case, the Slack mm -hmm. in general is the shout out. Anything the Slack else? in general definitely deserves it. Um, honestly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit larger scale here. Um, I'm going to shout out uh, all of the folks who've contributed to Chromium, both at Google and elsewhere. Like, it is the work of many hands, um, and it would not be what it is without the contributions from the folks at Google, the folks at Microsoft, folks at Yandex, folks at Naver. Like, all of these different browsers and projects, and all of the different individuals that have contributed. Like, everyone in the author's file. So, shout out to all of those folks. Um, and also, I really want to shout out the open source projects, like not even part of Chromium, that we use and rely on every day, right? So for example, like we use LLVM, which is a separate open source project for our compilation tool chain. And I think I'm, I would not be exaggerating to say that Chromium couldn't exist in its current form without the efforts of a bunch of other open source projects that we're kind of like making use of, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm really hopeful and, and optimistic that Chromium can kind of like live up to that. Like they're, we're standing on the shoulders of a lot of other open source projects to build the thing that we've built. And I'm hopeful that in turn, other projects are going to stand on our shoulders to build like yet cooler stuff and like yet, you know, yet better programs and build a yet better open source community. Um, so shout out to all of the authors of all the open source software that Chromium uses, which is a lot of people, but they deserve it. Yeah, for sure. It's very cool how it's very, you know, all very related. And even <laughs> within like Chrome, I think people stick around longer than, you know, typical oh, yeah. other projects. And it's cool to see people around like a decent number of them yeah. um, before Chrome launched, right? And that's yeah, exactly. to, you know, a generally more positive engineering culture. So that's very good. I think so, but I'm biased, of course. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, cool. You mentioned mailing lists a bunch. Uh, any favorites that you have? Oh, uh, yeah. Chromium Dev is the, the mailing list of my heart, I would say. Like, it's, it's the main open source development mailing list for us. Um, it's a great place for all of your kind of newbie questions. If you're just like, how the heck do I even check out the source? Like, that's a good place to ask. Um, the the topic specific mailing lists, especially net dev and security dev, are really good if you have questions in those specific areas. Um, but honestly, all the mailing lists on Chromium.org are good. I, I haven't yet encountered one where I'm like, that mailing list is bad. So <laughs> check them all out. Cool. All right, check out every single mailing list. Down yeah, down. every mailing list, every Slack channel. All right, great. All good. Every Slack channel, I think. Yeah. I'll add myself to the rest of them. 
Um, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, Ellie. Uh, of course. Thank you for chatting with us and see you all next time. All right. Thank you, Shen. Yeah, Easter egg. In the second part of this video, Ellie is drinking soda.